up guys, it's Kayla and Jim. Welcome back to another Meteorology Monday. What are we talking about today? Today we are going to talk about the June 2003 Manchester, South Dakota F4 tornado. That one was a little tricky. Yeah. Because there was not a whole lot of information on this and as we dove into it more we found some very interesting things. But yes. That F4 tornado was one of the strongest ones recorded as part of a larger outbreak. There was 67 tornadoes in the state of South Dakota that day. And that was part of a larger outbreak of 125 tornadoes across the Central Plains. But before we get started. If you find that you're enjoying this case study along the way, be sure to leave a like and subscribe down below so you never miss the next Meteorology Monday. Now let's get into the setup for this event. On the morning of June 24th, 2003, the weather models were showing a large scale area of mid-level rotation at the 700 and 500 millibar layers, roughly between 10 and 18,000 feet moving northeast into eastern and southeastern South Dakota. Precipitable water levels were increasing to two inches, and both strong warm air advection and strong 700 millibar theta E ridging, which is an indicator of severe weather potential to meteorologists, were taking place. At the surface, a front was oriented from northeast to southwest across the eastern Dakotas with warm moist air out ahead of the front and cool dry air behind it. Some models were suggesting that the surface front would become stationary and possibly drift north and west during the day as an upper level low pressure system moved into the region. This would lead to additional low level moisture and increased warm air advection later in the afternoon. Upper level divergence was also forecasted by the weather models as the northern jet stream moved into the western Dakotas later that day. Abundant moisture was present in the air with even the 850 millibar layer showing dew points at or above 60 degrees Fahrenheit by that evening. Although the severe potential was still in question, there was no doubt that all these factors would lead to a heavy rainfall event. With these parameters coming into place, the Aberdeen, South Dakota National Weather Service issued flood watches for counties within their warning area. The morning's convection left outflow boundaries, which reinforced the stationary front laying across the area. This further enhanced the concentration of low-level warm air advection and with the addition of afternoon surface heating would create an extremely unstable environment of 4,500 joules per kilogram of mixed layer cape. Around 2.15 p.m. Central Daylight Time, the Storm Prediction Center in Norman, Oklahoma issued Tornado Watch number 580 for portions of Northwest Iowa, Southwest Minnesota, Central and Northeast Nebraska, and Southeastern South Dakota until 10 p.m. Central Daylight Time that evening. Tornadoes, hail up to three inches in diameter, thunderstorm wind gusts to 80 miles per hour, and dangerous lightning would be possible within the watch area. A surface front was forecast to be draped from southeast South Dakota to northern Nebraska around 21Z, or 4 p.m. Central Daylight Time. According to SPC, expect coverage of storms to increase later this afternoon and evening as large-scale ascent overspreads this area in advance of a mid-level trough over the Rockies and a surface low in southwest Nebraska. Mixed-level cape values of 3,000 to 4,000 joules per kilogram, increasing vertical shear, and boundary layer dew points in the 70s are all favorable for supercells with very large hail and tornadoes. The threat for damaging winds may increase later this afternoon as storms evolve into one or more clusters along the surface boundary. By 3 p.m. Central Daylight Time, ingredients came together as the cold front just south of Aberdeen, South Dakota, inched further north, allowing deeper moisture transport into the area. The low-level jet and a mid-level short wave were approaching the area and thunderstorms began intensifying into supercells. Shortly before 6 p.m. Central Daylight Time, the supercell responsible for the Manchester tornado would initiate just north of the warm front, where low-level winds were backing. Within 30 minutes of the storm's generation, the Woonsocket F3 tornado was formed. 
While this was happening, the Storm Prediction Center issued a mesoscale discussion concerning Tornado Watch number 580. They mentioned, extreme SP capes continue across the weather watch with roughly 5,000 joules per kilogram observed south of the wind shift across the warm sector. Several intensifying potentially tornadic supercells are observed across southeastern South Dakota into southwestern Minnesota, while other rapidly intensifying activity is spreading northeastward across southwestern Nebraska. As the low-level jet increases over the central plains this evening, additional supercells will develop, likely displaying tornadic characteristics. Central portions of the weather watch should become much more active over the next few hours. Between 6.30 p.m. and 7.30 p.m. Central Daylight Time, storms erupted across eastern South Dakota and turned severe, prompting the Aberdeen National Weather Service to issue severe thunderstorm and tornado warnings. Zero-Z soundings showed very steep lapse rates and strong shear at the low and mid levels. This supported large hail as well as the potential for tornadoes. Dropping down just north of the village of Esben, the tornado rapidly formed into a wedge-like structure. Engineer and storm chaser Tim Samaris and his crew were heading east on Highway 14, racing ahead of the storm in an attempt to deploy instrumentation in the path of the tornado. The slow-moving, wide tornado helped maximize their chance of getting a direct hit. They decided to turn north onto 424th Ave, a gravel road just a half mile west of Manchester. Around 7.30 p.m. Central Daylight Time, the tornado barreled its way northward toward Highway 14 and the town of Manchester as an F4 monster with winds over 200 miles per hour, obliterating everything in its path. The wedge tornado was wider than the town itself, which only spanned about four blocks in either direction. After a few moments, Samaris turned east two miles north of the town on 425th Ave. With only seconds to spare, Tim deployed the orange cone-shaped probe by the roadside and then made a quick getaway north on 425th. As the tornado approached, it transitioned from a wedge into a tall stovepipe shape. Objects were picked up and dropped miles away from town. The funnel would continue to stretch and elongate while curving northwestward during its decaying or occlusion phase. The devastating tornado would eventually rope out about three miles north of Manchester. Tim Samaris and crew navigated back to pick up their probe. After reviewing the data that night, they were surprised to discover a 100 millibar pressure drop inside the tornado within seconds. According to Tim, that would be the equivalent of gaining 4,000 feet of altitude almost instantaneously, which would burst your eardrums. This scientific breakthrough shattered previous estimations of the pressure inside a tornado. It was with this measured pressure drop that they were able to calculate the wind speeds of over 200 miles per hour. In summary, the June 2003 tornado outbreak tied the record at that time for most tornado touchdowns in a single day for one state, with 67 tornadoes across the eastern and southeastern parts of South Dakota within an eight-hour time frame. The most powerful tornado during the outbreak was located near Manchester, South Dakota, which was rated an F4 on the Fujita scale. Winds were estimated by the National Weather Service to be up to 260 miles per hour. Every building in town was either heavily damaged, destroyed, or swept away, and numerous trees were debarked. Fortunately, there were zero fatalities reported, but at least four people were injured by the storm. The Manchester tornado observed an air pressure drop of 100 millibars within seconds. According to Samaris at that time, that's the biggest drop ever recorded. The data recorded by Tim Samaris and team was the first step in allowing for more accurate models of vortices and tornadoes. A permanent monument was installed, recognizing some of the greater moments in the town's history, as well as the tornadic event that day. More than 20 years later, you can still see the effects of the Manchester tornado. The remaining residents relocated to other nearby, more established towns. Since the town of Manchester was already struggling, it made no sense to rebuild. South Dakota Legislature disincorporated the town of Manchester in 2004, making it officially a ghost town today. Although this was a devastating F4 tornado, there is no recorded documentation of any tornado warnings being issued for Kingsbury County or the town of Manchester. So there's the summary. Very interesting things that occurred with this event. One of them being the last thing you said, and that was we couldn't really find any documentation on a tornado warning for Kingsbury County 
or the town of Manchester itself, where Manchester is in Kingsbury County. If there is something out there, let us know, comment below. But we weren't able to look it up and we actually did a search yeah. from all the warnings that were put out by the Aberdeen, South Dakota National Weather Service, yep. that, that includes Kingsbury County, and none of their severe thunderstorm or tornado warnings uh, had any warnings for that area. No, which is incredibly weird to think about the strongest tornado of that day being this huge F4 tornado and there wasn't a single warning put out for it. It wasn't on the ground for very long, but still I would expect some sort of warning to be put out for a storm that makes a tornado like that. The only thing I can think of that it was such a short duration, developed very quickly, it was in a very rural location, so there yeah. wasn't a whole lot, but you did have storm chasers. And in yeah. fact, one of the later warnings for counties to the north and east of that location, they actually had put in there a tornado right. warning for that county for that storm because a storm spotter saw the tornado in Manchester. And there wasn't really a whole lot of information in general, especially with some of the case studies we've done, there's usually a plethora of a lot of right. information out right. there. But maybe going back to 2003, there really isn't a whole lot in the database. Yeah, a lot of this case study was pulled directly from maps that were archived from that day, such as you know surface maps, um, watches, warnings, the area forecast discussions, products put out by SPC. But there wasn't a lot written up about this tornado done by any National Weather Service. Another interesting thing about this event, so 67 tornadoes in South Dakota alone, 120 something in a total outbreak. Now, the day did not set up very like conducive for tornadoes. You notice a lot of the things that they were saying in the front half of the day, they were talking about rainfall events, they were talking about flooding, they were talking about the chance for a couple severe storms, maybe some hail and wind, but tornadoes didn't really enter the discussion until later in the day, at least for the Aberdeen, South Dakota Weather Service office. We did go over how there was upper level divergence, which helps with instability, and eventually in the day you saw that the Cape values were through the roof, but there were some parts of the day where the winds were actually backing, which is the opposite of what you want for tornadic events. It wasn't until a certain event happened later in the day that things started kicking off. What was that weird thing that happened? <laughs> so you had the stationary front pretty much lying from northeast to southwest across that county warning area. What complicated things also was the outflow boundaries from mm -hmm. earlier convection. And then once all the dynamics started coming into play later in the afternoon and the upper level low off to the west kind of pulling that front a little bit more north and west opened up eastern and southeastern part of South Dakota into more of the warm sector which gave any storms that fired more energy to use a lot of the terms with the uh, the ML Cape, SB Cape, all that, all the Cape stuff uh, the convective available potential energy so any storm going into that kind of environment had more energy to work with to rapidly grow and develop into a severe supercell or a tornadic supercell as well. It's really a testament to having all of the ingredients coming together instead of having an event driven by a massive front or a massive pressure system. It's really one of those days where all the right ingredients just lined up at the same time in the same area to produce devastating tornado events. And also props to National Weather Service personnel and storm spotters, people coming together because sometimes strong storms do occur out in rural areas and it can be missed, not intentionally obviously, but it's just the technology for back then. Fortunately, the storm spotters were there to be yeah. able to relay that or else it might not have gone warned yeah. uh, in the next counties. Classic case like El Reno, where it's out in the middle of fields and, and there's nothing there, but that had obviously more attention to it a being <laughs> later and you had a lot more chasers. It's very interesting how just by working together, you know, you try not to miss, miss these events. Yeah, and by having the storm chasers there, um, with having Tim Samaras and his team putting down the instrumentation and the probe got hit by the tornado and measuring one of the first instances of what happens actually inside a tornado, being able to use that for not only how we look at tornadoes today, but also increasing warning times as that was a big problem back 20 years ago. And what about that 100 millibar pressure drop That's within insane. seconds? Now we've seen some reports within five seconds, within 12 seconds. So we just kind of broad brushed it and said, you know, within a matter of seconds, a hundred millibar drop. Now that would, according to Tim, was the equivalent of going from zero to 4,000 feet up 
in a matter of seconds. Fortunately yeah. for Tim and team, the storm was moving or the tornado was moving slow enough that they could have enough time, relatively speaking, right. to get to the location, deploy the probe and get out of there in the safe amount of time. Unfortunately, moving slow also meant moving that slow over the town of Manchester, which gave it more time to destroy the whole town. So that's, yeah. you know, you got the negatives there. You've got some positives that came out of it with collecting the data and being able to improve warnings and modeling. So it's it kind of works together in a sense. Crazy to think though that this tornado is the reason that the town no longer exists even, what are we, 20 years later and I believe it was you know due to a number of factors and there wasn't a lot of people there a lot of people left over the years to go to bigger towns yeah when this came through they just didn't see a reason to rebuild the town but then they've got that memorial there talking yep. about its history it's interesting so if you're ever near the town of Manchester it right. might be something to check out that would be really cool to see I think the next time we're out near South Dakota we're gonna have to make a stop over there definitely not that we're ever out near South Dakota but it might happen <laughs> <laughs> you never know. We are planning to make a trip. We are. Out to the Central Plains this year. So let's see what happens. We'll see what happens. So there you have it. The June 24th, 2003 Manchester, South Dakota F4 tornado. Again, if you like what you saw, be sure to leave a like and subscribe down below so you never miss the next Meteorology Monday. Check us out on Facebook and Instagram. We post all of our weather adventures there. If you'd love to support the page and support what we're doing, check us out on Patreon. We have a couple different options over there as well as checking out our school of weather which is the top link in the description box if you are ready to take your weather knowledge to the next level it's about two hours worth of courses it's got some pdf guides that walk you through it learn at your own pace we're there if you have questions so join us over on school of weather we'd love to have you join us until next time i'm kayla and i'm jim thanks for watching and we'll see you at the next meteorology monday Manchester. Manchester.